Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. And I particularly want to say hello to my friends in Italy who are finally getting acknowledged. And we're going to talk about Italy again today because you know what? Look at the world map. The United Kingdom, I mean, they were so excited about getting it right and they have, they have been getting it wrong. But I want to show the vaccination map because this is a real problem. If you look at almost all of Africa, it's still way behind vaccinations. And there are whole parts of, uh, like in India and uh, Eurasia, until we have worldwide adequacy of vaccination, we're going to be living with this virus for a long, long time. And we still have the opportunity for it to mutate. Remember, we were all great in July, then all of a sudden the Delta mutation happened and we had this giant surge. Everyone's talking about how we're coming out of it. We're coming out of it only if Delta remains the dominant strain. If we get a strain that replaces Delta, we're going to be right back in it again. So we need to start thinking a lot about worldwide vaccination. So speaking of our friends in the United Kingdom who declared July 19th to be, you know, Freedom Day from the virus, not only are they doing poorly, they're having an increase in cases. I mean, they are really not, they're probably the worst than Europe right now. And it's because they refuse to practice public health measures. And I'm going to show Italy again because a week later, just as we did last week, their numbers are continuing to come, to come down. And why? They implemented Lily's five-point plan. They have vaccine mandates. They have vaccine passports. Let me emphasize again. Vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, and masking. And they're doing a really great job. And let's go back to remind ourselves about the Olympics in Japan. Remember when the... Olympics started, Japan was just on a slight surge up and the Olympics rocketed them into a huge outbreak. Two weeks after, just two weeks after, they peaked. That's classic, right? It takes two weeks to get the infection spread. And after that, the, there are two major things that happened. The prime minister resigned for mishandling the pandemic and they really implemented aggressive public health measures, particularly public masking. Now, Culturally, the Japanese like to wear masks during flu season, but it wasn't such a big stretch. But look at this picture of people walking around. Every single person, every single person wearing a mask. So when people go, a mask don't really help. Well, we've got a country. We have a few million people who just proved that it really, really works well. So, you know, we can learn lessons from Italy and we can learn lessons from Japan. If you look at the hot spots in the United States, you know, the same places are, are looking bad, the upper, the upper Midwest. Alaska is really on fire, if you look at Alaska. And, you know, when we start talking about what is a low level of, of infection, the CDC and most people view it as less than 10 cases per 100,000. And so just to give you some, some sense, moderate would be 10 to 50 cases per 100,000. Alaska right now is 300 cases per 100,000. Oregon has 114 per 100,000. And our friends in Custer County, remember that county that has one person per, per square mile? They're having 35 cases per 100,000. And I just threw Italy up there. If the United States looked like Italy, they have less than five per 100,000 as a country, we'd be doing pretty darn good. And so there's a lot, I've been watching the TV, a lot of people saying, oh, we're doing great, we're doing great. Well, this is where we are right now. And by the way, the rate of decline is slowing and we're still higher than we were in waves one and two. You know, we have 44 million people have been infected. We think probably that's a, an, underestimate, an underestimation by at least a, uh, two thirds. And we're all now at 715,000 deaths. And as I said last week, I think it's very likely that we'll reach 800,000 deaths. And this is a really interesting uh, graph I want to show you. If you look at where are the weekly cases? You see all these peaks. Everyone below that line is, is over the age of 65. So the cases are really low, and that's because in 65 and up in the United States, we've got 95% of the population that had at least one dose and 85% that are fully vaccinated. But who's getting hospitalized and who's dying? It's the people over 65. They're the peak for hospitalizations and the peak for death. So when we all talk about why should young people get vaccinated? Well, for one thing, to protect themselves because they're being hospitalized and they're dying, but not at the rate as, as the older community. And so in order to protect our, our vulnerable older community and me, will somebody please help me? Uh, you, we just need everyone to pull together. 
And you know, the IHME, our Institute for Health Metrics, is projecting that we're gonna be living with this virus a long time. It's not falling, it's gonna continue. And my, and my sister said, well, why is that? We keep vaccinating more and more people. We have about 44 million known cases, we know about that. And if you do a prevalence study, we think probably three times that have actually been infected. So there's probably, you know, 132 million people in the United States that have been infected with this virus. And there's like 330 million people, so about a third of the country. We're up to about, you know, 182 million vaccinated, okay? And if you think about half of those vaccinated were people who probably were already previously infected, you know, if you do an estimate, it's probably somewhere around 248 million people who are resistant. We got to get to 90 to 95 percent resistance before herd immunity takes place. So we still have 82 million people in the United States who are susceptible. You know, that's a lot of people, and that's why the IHME is projecting those 82 million are continue, going to continue to be susceptible and will continue to drive the epidemic in the United States. Now, if you look at how are we doing in Texas, you know, okay, not great. Our friends in Dimmick County, you know, they're doing okay. They're about 47 cases per 100,000. But, you know, we're in the same category. Moderate is 10 to 50. You know, Harris County is 20 per 100,000. So we're not much better than Dimmick County. We are still not getting to the level that I would feel com comfortable. If you start thinking about 10 cases or less than 10 cases per 200,000 in our community, that would be like under 200 cases a day. So what's going on in our community? Are we at 200? No, we're at 1,200 cases today. 1,300 is coming down, but we're still five or six times the amount that is, would be considered a reasonable amount of virus in the community, a low level of virus. And hospitalizations are also declining, but we're still getting 145 people admitted every week. Now, a lot of people have asked, what about natural immunity? Is natural immunity really all that good? And there was a really great paper in Nature from the Nuss and Swig lab at Rockefeller, and they were trying to answer this question. How adequate is immunity if you've been naturally infected? So they looked at 63 people who'd actually recovered from COVID-19, and they looked at 1.3 months, 6.2 and 12 months after infection. About 40% of those people had also been, uh, had received the mRNA vaccine. So what's really amazing, in the absence of vaccination, so that 60% that just got naturally infected, what they showed was that antibody reactivity to the receptor binding domain and neutralizing antibodies and the number of B cells, memory B cells, was really very stable between six and 12 months. It wasn't falling. When they vaccinated people, there was a dramatic increase in those components, not only the antibody levels, but also the memory B cells. And that it was the amount of, vac the amount of response uh, to vaccination was equivalent to if you had a naive person that got vaccinated with this va the original vaccines to the original strain. So it is really very powerful if you've, gotten vac if you've gotten infected and then get vaccinated. And what they showed is the level of antibody is not only high in those people, but it also is incredibly effective at taking care of all of the variants. So here's one of the advantages if you've actually gotten infected. Get vaccinated and you will be able to handle all the variants almost better than people who have just been vaccinated alone and not infected. Very interesting paper, as I said. It really shows you the importance of long-term immunity uh, that you have with B cell memory, uh, something we have not spent enough time talking about. We came talking only about neutralizing antibody. There was another good uh, study that came out of several different sources looking at the complications of myocarditis from the Pfizer vaccine. And there were two studies out of Israel, very large studies, that looked at five million people who received uh, the Pfizer vaccine and two and a half million people who received the vaccine, two different studies. And in both cases, the risk was about one in 50,000. So very, very uh, low risk. Highest risk is in teenage boys and young men. It's about four in 100,000 uh, for, for men who are receiving their second dose and less than one in 100,000 for women. Uh, and, but just put it in the background, people who get COVID also get myocarditis. So the response to the vaccine is about twice as much, but it's still very, very low. Uh, and there was also a study in the U.S. military from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville uh, that identified about 23 cases in many uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, in, of vaccinated, and it came out to about eight cases per 100,000. And there was a CDC report that came out with six cases per 100,000. So I think if you take all the Israeli studies, all the vaccination studies, this, the myocarditis risk is very low, somewhere between four and five per 100,000, mostly in men, in young men. 
uh, and it's so low that I don't think it, uh, it should even be other than a warning and the consideration. Oh, and by the way, all, all of those is reversible, treatable, and, and no deaths from that complication. Well, flu season is upon us, so let's spend a little bit time talking about flu because we don't want to forget about it. In fact, we're all predicting it might be a really bad flu season because we've all been so, so missing flu for last year, we're all going to be really susceptible to it. So if you think about flu, each year there are about 200,000 people that get admitted to hospitals and about 36,000 deaths. So it's a, it's a significant illness. There are three major types of flu, influenza A, B, and C, and most of the, the epidemics are caused by influenza A and B. Influenza A is a really interesting uh, flu virus. There are over 100 subtypes. Uh, they've been found mostly in wild birds. That's the reservoir. But those viruses can infect humans, can infect other animals as well. But the, re the reservoir is really in wild birds. So occasionally, uh, an animal, like a pig, you know, can be infected with an avian virus and a human virus. And when they're in the same animal, a recombination event could take place. So parts of one virus are exchanged with parts of another, and that's called antigenic shift. But flu viruses are, are RNA viruses too, like COVID, and they undergo individual mutations, and that is called antigenic drift, and it modifies very, very slowly, uh, like the coronavirus, which is why, you know, we're lucky that the coronavirus doesn't have something like the antigenic shift that we, at least hasn't so far. So it's just a moderate change, not a big change. The reason flu is so tough is they have these big changes, so each year, uh, we're, we're really kind of susceptible again. The influenza viral genome is really interesting. There are eight strands of RNA and the, the capsule of the virus is co coated with uh, two major proteins, the hemagglutinin protein and the neuraminidase. The hemagglutinin protein is very important for, it's a fusion protein for binding to cell surface of human cells and then fusing in. And the neuraminidase is really important for escape of the viral particles out. And there's so many different varieties of the influenza A uh, proteins. There are 18 different uh, hemagglutin subtypes and there are 11 different neuraminidase subtypes. We identify the virus based on what the, H, what the hemagglutin is and what the N is. So when you say H1N1, it's the first vir variety of the hemagglutin and the, and the one variety of the neuraminidase. And if you look at these, uh, influenza B is much less likely to mutate so influenza A has a lot of variation, and you can see all the subclades, all the variation in influenza A. But influenza B has two major lineages. It's, uh, they're named after where they were isolated, uh, the Victoria, uh, isolate, the isolate from uh, uh, Australia and Yamagata. And so those two are the main lineages. And uh, as I said, influenza A tends to change a lot, influenza B not so much. And in making a vaccine, they usually, when they talk about quadrivalent vaccine, they pick usually one influenza H1N1, usually one influenza H3N2, and then one each of the B viruses. And that's why it's called a quadrivalent, because they have all four covered. So it's really interesting in the, this year, because of COVID and all of our public health measures, look at what happened with, with, with flu this year. It disappeared. I mean, it was, these are the number of influenza cases. You see all these spikes each year, 20, 21, nothing. And what happened and what we're really concerned about, that was true of many of the respiratory viruses, including respiratory uh, syncytial virus, which is a common virus in children, very serious upper respiratory infection. And look what happened with RSV this year. Because there were so many people susceptible, all of a sudden we had a giant spike. And so we're very concerned, all of us, that we're going to have a big flu spike now that we've relaxed all of our public health measures and masking and we have a susceptible population. You can see the big impact. There were very few deaths last year uh, in, because of flu. And in Australia, there were virtually no deaths. And so one of the things I want to say is we are really worried. <laughs> I mean, it's good news that it was great last year, but when we have a complete population that didn't get infected, we're very susceptible this year. So please. I know I've been begging you to get your COVID vaccines. Get your flu shot. Flu is going to be really, I think flu is going to be very bad this season. So uh, in the same way RSV was. So please get your, your flu shots. So this, I want to end this week with a couple of shout outs. First of all, a shout out to the Astros. I mean, you got to give them credit. I think it's their fifth win in a row in their division. Fantastic uh, team. And they, we, we hope that they win again. Uh, and of course, a giant shout out to William Shatner. Uh, Captain Kirk finally made it back to space. I have to tell you though, the whole thing with him being scared to death to go to space and making being a very public fear of this, 
you know, kind of, you know, I mean, kind of ruined my my view of Captain Kirk. I'm not sure I'm ever, I'm not sure I'm ever going to watch that courageous Captain Kirk go off and split his infinities to boldly go. It's supposed to be to go boldly, but to boldly go where no man has gone before. And of course, now I'm really excited because you don't know this yet, but first to hear about it, Lily has been selected to be the first dog in space. Now in the modern era. Remember, that I forget when the Russians are putting all kinds of animals up in space. I think they sent a dog up once, but Lily is gonna be the first one to go in the modern era. So we're very excited and we can't wait to tell you about that in the coming weeks. And until then, I can't wait to see you next week.